happens again. Hi, I'm James Hollywood Machikari. Join me Monday through Friday for more Psycho Mayhem Morning Show on YouTube Live, Facebook, and all major podcasting platforms where we talk about all the major biker news going on in the scene. Rock on! And how you guys doing? Welcome to the show. It's one of them days, baby. It is Tuesday. Hopefully you guys uh, are having a good start of your week. And I keep on crying and whining. Yeah, I know I'm supposed to do this and do that and get away from problems. But damn, is it cold up here in northern Illinois. It was a good rain today and the temperature just dropped. It got so damn cold, I stopped working on the damn trailer outside. I was like, man, I'm getting too damn old for this stuff. Really appreciate all the uh, comments about uh, starting the uh, flat track and some sporting news. I really enjoy that kind of stuff. I really do. Uh, we got a great show today for you. Actually, a pretty serious show for you. Serious show. There has been a guy. Now, his name is Mel Chansey going around on YouTube doing interviews. Well, oh, Mel... Mel, and I'm being nice, uh, is the uh, former uh, president of first the henchmen and then the uh, angels when it went down in the 90s. And let me tell you, man, we're going to go over some of the stuff. I'm actually going to play something he did on a podcast and break down stuff as he uh, is talking, pausing it, all that type of stuff. Now I get it. it you know, from... You talk to people from your point of view, but when you do that, as old Mike Pence says, you're entitled to your opinion, but not the facts. And I'm actually, I'm inviting you, Mel, to call in and we can talk about this stuff, man. Uh, Because a lot of the stuff you're saying is totally BS. BS, man. Like riding around in a Corvette with a 187 on your plate? Come on. Really? I know you're trying to appeal to the Sons of Anarchy crowd, but uh, people that are around that time with uh, not only... And that's one thing. I don't talk you know, on behalf of either freaking club in this whole thing. I'm just giving my personal opinion and the facts that I know to be true. Because there were support clubs back then. Uh, I knew a lot of what was going on because of the support club I was in. And uh, I heard this guy talk and I was like, Jesus Christ, you, you're serious, right? You're really saying that? Come on. You know, and uh, from what I know, Mel is out on bad, so we know how that usually goes. You know, one thing I don't understand is the tattoos. They're not they're not gone. They keep wearing them. I don't know how that club works, but, you know, is what it is. So we're going to go down and actually break down some of the stuff. And I might make this a series, man, because I do not believe... That you go on a, sh- a little known podcast show, I think he's like at 4,000 subscribers or something, and start banging on stuff that wasn't the truth. It wasn't. Now, let's be honest about it. From my understanding, allegedly, the henchmen were around like forever. But one day decided that they got, uh, you know, a spoon up their ass that they wanted to go the other way in a city where it's always been the one dominant. It wasn't them who popped everything off. I'd look in the mirror. And maybe this is a little, how can I say, personal to me. But I don't believe you go on these shows and start talking this and that. I just don't do it without any pushback. And everybody knows you're going to get pushback from me if I know the subject. But again, Mel, you can call into the show and we can have a discussion. We can have a debate, if you will. 
you no longer have ties to your old club. So there is nothing stop, and you're out bad. So there's nothing stopping you at all. You can't say, well, you know, we don't talk to the media. You can't say that because you got no ties. You're out bad. We can discuss what you discussed on this podcast. And we can do it for real. I ain't going to lob softball questions at you. No, we're going to debate. We'll have some pushback. We're going to get some questions out there about, you know, your point of view of the events that happened. Because right now, I see your video all over the place. And for those not smart enough to question you, because, you know, the guy who did the podcast, man, he was like all over your pecker. It was like, really, dude? You're, you're, you're starstruck here, buddy. You know, why don't you dig deeper? Why don't you get into this interview? Why don't you challenge him on his accounts? But that never happens. See, and this happens everywhere in public. They own, even our politicians, they do it all the time. They only take interviews from people that ain't going to push back on them. They're only going to do interviews with people they perceive as being on their side or they will push their position if you know what I mean so do I think he'd ever call in no 847-957-1656 by the way Mel and we'll get ourselves a, an interview going that's real if you wanted to talk that time period at least be real about it. Be real why it went down. Be real what your part was. Don't take, you know, don't talk about harems and stuff like that. Those were serious days. Nothing to be joked about. And when you go around saying people were a bunch of rats on the other side, you're stupid. And these are some of the stuff that you can challenge me on. So what do you think, guy? Call me up. Let's do a real deal, man. Do a real deal. Not some of these softball questions from people I've never even heard of that ain't even a part of the club scene. No more softball questions for you, man. You have decided to come out publicly and say this. I get it. You're trying to make your money off your past. Hey, a lot of people do it, and I understand it. That's the way to life. That's the way the business works. But I'm giving you a chance to come on a platform bigger than uh, old boy ever had. Come on, man. You'll be on Spotify. You'll be on iTunes where we get all the big hitters uh, for view or uh, listens and stuff. I am inviting you. I am pleading with you. This is a good debate. This, hey, this might even be good for you. People actually know who you are. That's what I have to say to that, man. Uh, but yeah, we're going to go over uh, the video. And then later on in the show, we're going to go over, well, yeah, an independent biker. You know, many of you guys out there say profiling isn't real. Well, he found out different. And now he is speaking about it. It just tickles my fancy when this kind of stuff happens because you got all these naysayers that say, no, this never happens. No, it, no, no. You know, that's just something the clubs make up. And like I always say, until it happens to you. <laughs> then it's not so made up, is it? You know, when you're sitting there on the side of the road, the cops are messing with you. All the, it's not made up, is it? Now you're seeing what's going on. That's why I always recommend that you have your camera phone on you. And when stuff starts going down, you hit that record button and you go live on one of your platforms. That way, even if they take your phone, it's still on your social media account. They can't erase it. So, and plus you got people watching live, commenting, and next thing you know, the shares go out and it's all over the damn place and, you know, you're happy. 
you're happy <laughs> uh plus i got the the flat track uh standings uh so far uh, in later on this sub uh, segment, but let's get on to this uh, news, shall we? Get your most unbiased and trusted biker news now at HarleyLiberty.com. Founded in 2012, Insane Throttle Biker News has been the place that all bikers come for what's happening in the scene. Go over now and bookmark HarleyLiberty.com. Rock on! Here we go, and this is actually a YouTube uh, video podcasting out. Yes, uh, he's got about 5,000 uh, subscribers, and the description in this video is Mel Chansey is the youngest leader of the Hells Angels MC ever in history, becoming the leader at just 23 years old. Mel Chansey has done multiple prison sentences and now devotes his life to serving others and helping whoever he comes in contact with. Well, how about, how about old Hollywood? Come on, how about old Hollywood? Come on and show. Everybody, push him. Well, the guy does have a new contest going 1,000 to the first uh, 10,000 subscribers. Rock and roll. So here we go. The day in the life of the Hells Angel president, Mel Chansey. And this is an interview from 2020. I guess the whole interview, this is like only nine minutes of it, uh, is out on this guy's podcast. So you know what? I'll be doing little bits and pieces here. Go to this guy's channel and check out the whole interview because, quite frankly, I don't have time for that most expensive restaurants because i'm making a ton of money back then so, so basically during the, the 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 height of the war you're not trying to be low-key you're not no trying to be discreet you're literally doing the opposite of that i'm driving around in a corvette with mr 187 on the plate you which, know which 187 for those who don't know the penal code for murder you know um so i'm flamboyant I have business cards that uh, that have. Okay, let's stop there. At the height of the war, now, what year were you talking about? Uh, I, you know, that might have been in the other segment, but at the height of the war, I guarantee, freaking t you, you were not going out being flamboyant, especially when the third. Well, at the time, it was the second largest bombing in the United States went off on Grand Avenue, but now it's the third largest bomb that went off on grand avenue and you can find actually that story all you have to do is look it up that's all you have to do is look it up you'll see it uh but at the height of the war after two have already been uh uh allegedly well I'm not, you know what i'm not going to get into that part uh but you're saying you're running around being flamboyant like there's not a care in the world with all that was going on during that time. I call bullshit. Have made that said crime incorporated. We supply what you demand. I'm just pushing the button at the federal prison going, take me in, take me in. Take me in, take me in. Crime incorporated. The dude thought he was the Chicago outfit. And right. Not knowing it at the time, <laughs> but I mean, I'm just, I get it. I am going, I get it. 23 24 years old making a gang of cash and having the club on the track of man we were outnumbered in chicago as far as revenue you're making a ton of cash the majority of income that you guys had coming in was from the drug game and the guns and the guns got me, it the drugs and oh that is really something to say right there you know i know a lot of people go after clubs for that type of stuff but I never thought I'd hear today out bad member or ex member, current member actually say that on an interview. I've never thought I'd see the day that that happened. Here he's saying, well, we were doing the drugs, we were running the guns. <sighs> well, it wasn't in Chicago, I can tell you, because you guys weren't in Chicago. You know, after that Grand Avenue incident, uh, now it's outside of Harvey. That's like 30 or 40 miles away from downtown Chicago. But here's a guy who is openly admitting what he was doing. I'm freaking real. The guns, you know, I was able to get 
you know, nice source yeah. of revenue through both. Yeah. I didn't have a care nor I had the girls, I had the money, I had the different spots, you know, and I was living that, you know, I don't want to say everybody's dream because not everybody's doing that, but I'm li- at, at 23 years old, I'm like, I'm like a kid in Toys R Us. Like they opened up the door and they said, kids in Toys R Us during the great freaking Chicago war. Great way to look at it. said, son, run through here. Everything's free. And I'm running through, right? You know, and keeping the crew on track and keeping us, you know, making sure we're taking care of business and that we were very outnumbered in, in Chicago, you know, from the other, from the other side, you know, the outlaws were very, very dominant there, man. And, uh, you know, at the height of everything, you know, we had 27 guys and in all the areas around us, the outlaws put their crews together. I mean, they can put 120 guys together and, you know, in 30 minutes of phone calls. So we were really, you know, outnumbered. But what kept us strong was the unity we had with each other. We had a young crew, me being the youngest, but I showed you a picture and we had a very young crew. And uh, so you're telling me at 23 years old, 23 years old, and I was in my early 20s when this shit was going on, uh, you ran a crew going up against one of the biggest dominants in this area. That's what you're saying. Uh, most of the guys trained. Back then, there was no MMA, so we were just all pounding on the bags. Sure. You had to make sure you were in shape, but you couldn't be so big that you know you were in a bar and you couldn't fight. You had to so be ready to go. That's why I was. Everybody's like, "Man, Mel's good with his hands," because I practiced as I was growing. Sure. So as I was 290 pounds, I could still get on that bag and work that heavy bag because we were. You never know. We were fighting in bars with just street people from Chicago. Mm-hmm. Chicago was a rough place back in the day. It the still South is. Chicago, yeah. I mean, you get to got to get a guy that gets stabbed in the bar, and they're shooting pool over him. Nobody breaks stride mm-hmm. back, you know, back then. So, <clears throat> um, what you forgot to mention is during that whole time period uh, when uh, you guys decided the other way is you weren't seen in any bars. It was very, very hectic. It got to the point where, like I said, I, I was I would take a girl out for, you know, let's go downtown to Tavern on Rush and Eat tonight. OK, babe. OK. And then the three guys are sitting at the table next to me. Sometimes they'd sit at the table with me and stuff. But if it was like the girl and I was trying to have like a halfway romantic dinner with her, the fellows would be like, we'll just be at the table next year. I'd be at the bar right here and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it, it was crazy. You know, I became. Without knowing, I became public enemy number one to the federal government. To the, to, to back then, Janet Reno was the was the attorney general. Of the- oh my God, you're giving so much <laughs> public enemy number one, really, really. I kind of think it was on the other side, don't you? All the heat was coming down there. I wonder who you had in your crew talking. United States, uh, Janet Reno was. And um, it, the things got so crazy with the bombings and the shootings and everything like that, that the government put a full court press on us, you know, um, and Jan Reno named it Operation Lucifer. And uh, so what happened under, under this Operation Lucifer case, they raided five of us. Me, the vice president, the sergeant of arms, the secretary, the treasurer, they raided five of us on this one morning. And... Uh, they locked us all up, and, the, and they really got nothing. At one of the guys' houses, they were scraping cocaine off a mirror. I mean... Well, that was for your own protection, you know, just to throw that out there. <laughs> they wanted you off the streets, so, you know, I'm not going to keep going there. Little minute dust like that. My house, they grabbed a drawer full of steroids, which I took back, and everybody knew I was taking steroids. They grabbed about 32 different guns that were locked up in a safe, and my girl had a, a gun card at the time. I didn't, but I wasn't a felon. So they couldn't charge me with none of the guns that were in the house. And um, so they charged me with um, inositol. And I know you're probably familiar with that, it, it, which is a vitamin B. It's a, called an, inositol. And, uh, but back in the day, everybody cut their cocaine with it because right. it was white. It didn't smell. It was you know pure. It was a vitamin. Yep. And um, so I had a big jar of it, a one-pound jar or whatever like that. So they said that they uh, did some testing on it, and they said I cross-contaminated it by putting the spoon from the cocaine. And they charged me with a pound of cocaine, which when we went to court, it, everything got dropped because it was all just pure inositol. 
So long story short, that Operation Lucifer got everybody a misdemeanor. So you could imagine Ooh, how pissed, how off, pissed she was. off the government was when... Because let's just paint the picture, because people who have never been through the system don't understand the man hours, the time, the energy, yes. the money. Like, they're fully fucking committed. Their, their purpose, their agenda, months, some in some cases, years yeah. of their life yeah. is dedicated to one thing, and that's getting a conviction. Yes. And you're damn, you know what? You just outed yourself right there. Either you or one of your guys. There's no way the government under that operation was going to let you go. Not on a misdemeanor. A solid conviction and not a misdemeanor. No. <laughs> I mean, it was so bad at the end. They were like, hey, will your clients plead guilty to one year in prison? And our lawyers were like, no, we'll go to trial. Right. So then finally they were like, okay, they couldn't charge me for the distribution of steroids because what got them in our houses was three consecutive trash pickups. They were taking my trash from the street. We didn't know it. This was a guy that earlier said that he agreed that his crew was in the drugs and guns. This coming from him. They were getting syringes out of me because I was injecting myself and everything like that. So they tried to charge me with the distribution of steroids, which would have been the felony, but they couldn't get it for, on me because obviously I was a bodybuilder taking the hormones. You know, they had the broken needles in there, the broken ampules and stuff like that. So, like I said, I pled guilty to a misdemeanor, got a year supervision. So did the other four guys. They got nothing on them. It was a big flop. And that's when I knew right then and there that the shit was on. The shit was on. And now we were at kind of, so to say, a war with the federal government. So now there, now, now there is, in fact, two wars. Going yeah, on. two wars going on. <laughs> I, used, I say it all the time. I had the, the other guys that were trying to knock my head off my shoulders and put it on a mailbox stick. And I had the government that was trying to give, you know, pump me sunlight in a, through 100 years in prison and put me under, under a prison. So you're telling me a 23-year-old supposedly leading a crew uh, was smart enough to fight a war on two fronts. But that one thing that you said about uh, that's how I used to make my money and stuff. Yeah, real nice right there, man. Real nice to put out there uh yeah but i'll go in through uh you know i'm gonna take a look because there's some people that's been pointed out more to me in that interview i'll take a look at it but that's horse shit right there anyway let's go to some good stuff here harley's ride for a cause with bikers and bras event by gary redding harley davidson owners are rubbing their engines for a good cause this month breast cancer awareness save the tatas baby the ladies of Harley, the Harley's owner group, and Diamondback Harley Davidson of Lawton Fort Sill will present Bikers and Bras from 9 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. October 17th at Diamondback Harley Davidson, 301 Southeast Interstate. Bikers and Bras will feature a poker run starting at the Diamondback Harley Davidson. Motorcycles, cars, and trucks will follow the planned scenic route to points of interest and in businesses through Southwest Oklahoma. The event is an effort to raise uh, breast ca uh, cancer awareness and funds the center or cancer center of Southwest Oklahoma. So if you're down that way, go check it. Also, Biker Group donates funds, food to victory in the valley you know what we got a lot of stuff a lot of freaking clubs out there helping the community that they don't get freaking uh you know credit for a uh, cold uh, a couple weeks ago underground kings held their 11th annual bikers for boobs fundraiser event which offered a bike show food drinks uh, raffles and auctions Every year, all proceeds go to support Victory in the Valley, a cancer treatment center in Wichita. This year, they raised nearly $9,000 and a literal van full of donated food for Victory in the Valley's pantry. That's what I'm talking about. That's bikers right there. Not this other nonsense you just heard. Uh... I just keep thinking this is probably the last year then they come back again with even more and their hearts are as big as his city. Co-founder of Victory in the Valley, Di Diana Tommy said, They are incredible people and we love each one of them. The Underground King said they hold this event every year because they say nearly everyone has been impacted by cancer in some way. So true. 
Oh, we even got more for you, man. Bikers are just out there doing stuff, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to go through and try to find as much as I can for the show today to show just how good bikers really are. I did a, you know, a standalone where I talked about bikers are truly the American people right there. You know, nothing is as American as a biker. Hopefully you guys check that one out. West Virginia Bikers Show Support for Police with Back the Blue Rally by W Boy. Morgantown, West Virginia, Blue Back the Blue Parade and Rally took place in Morgantown on Saturday. The parade began at the Morgantown Mall and drove through White Park and finished at the Triple S Harley Davidson. Back the Blue is a public awareness campaign designed and dedicated to displaying public support for law enforcement throughout the United States. Jessica Legg and Sarah Beth Holder were two of the people who made Saturday's event possible. The two met through a woman's Republican group and decided to put together the event to show peacefully their support for the police women and women risk their lives to protect and preserve our freedoms. Quote, we had a lot of people reach out and say it's never been done before. So that's a big thing for us. We want to show we do support. We're not choosing someone's life over someone else's life. We just want to show we are all supported in every aspect of life. People traveled from other states just to participate in the parade, and several retired officers spoke at the rally. The goal of the event was to raise money for the Back the Blue cause and to inform people about the importance of the men and women in blue. Quote, I think back to a night in downtown Morgantown, another officer and I were walking on the high street and we heard gunshots. The officer, uh, the other officer and I ran towards the area where the gunfire was taking place and as we were running to the scene, there were numerous people running away from the area of the gunfire. My fellow officer said, quote, there must be something wrong with us if we're running towards gunfire when everyone else is running away. I've thought about the comment numerous times over the years. There's nothing wrong with us. It takes a special kind of person to be a police officer. Now, my favorite story here. <laughs> oh. Na, na, na. LMT Online, Texas. Texas. What have we been saying? Search is yielding resentment. When Thomas Coase saw the red lights pulsating behind him, he figured he probably deserved the ticket. It was the one-of-a-kind t-shirt warm May evening that exists for motorcycle riding and he got carried away with the throttle. Yet right off, Texas Department of Public Safety Trooper Rick Cotto seemed to suspect cost of more than just speeding. Uh-oh! Quote, how much did you drink tonight? Your eyes are kind of glassy. That's why I'm asking. You've ever been arrested, uh, the trooper asked. According to the dash cam recording of the stop, what's illegal on the motorcycle? What about on your person? You're giving him an enema. Nothing cost, replied. Cotto asked if he could search the bike. Cost the decline. The trooper said he was going to summon a drug-sniffing dog to check it out anyway. The trooper had Koss empty his pockets as he padded them down. Afterward, Koss waited in the tall grass on the side of the highway. Statistically, police are terrible at determining which motorcycles or motorists are worthy of being detained and searched. Most turn up nothing, often relying on signs of driver's deception that research long has debunked. Officers distinguish liars from truth-tellers at a rate barely above chance. <laughs> Historically, any inconvenience to or humiliation of those searched unnecessarily has been given little judicial weight. But a steady stream of recorded confrontations between police and citizens has prompted a national reevaluation of how best to safely and efficiently deploy sworn officers. Especially in Texas, you profiling idiots. Uh, viewed through that lens, the practice of using simple traffic stops as opportunities to search drivers and passengers 
where other lawbreaking, despite the low odds, is especially fraught, said Sarah so- CO, author of Police in the Open Road, A Legal History of Vehicle Searches. You guys get her book. I like her. Investigative stops are rarely uh, ineffective and dangerous. Costs, like most people subject to an intrusive police encounter, headed home grateful he'd only gotten a ticket. Things could have been so much worse, he recalled. Relief, some gave way to anger, however. He was a middle-aged, law-abiding product manager for an Austin-area tech firm, what possibly could have warranted the embarrassment treatment he received. I told you guys, profiling's not just for club members, not for patches, any of it. It could happen to anybody. And I love this story because it shows you that a middle-aged, law-abiding product manager got profiled. Think about that next time you're bumping on the stories we do about clubs getting profiled. Wrong most of the time, Texas police performed just under a million searches during traffic stops last year. According to figures reported to the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement, about one in five resulted in contraband being found. The agency's numbers aren't perfect. It combines several types of searches, and some police departments appear to have entered data incorrectly. No, they wouldn't do that. <laughs> uh, let's see here. After checking cost paperwork, Cotta returned to where cost was ready, waiting. You uh, seem awfully nervous to me. You keep looking away. You have a hard time making eye contact. I feel like you might be hiding something from me. That's the way I feel. He replied, I'm sorry that you feel that way. That is not the case. Police once needed probable cause that a crime was occurring to investigate motorists uh, during the stop. But in 68, the U.S. Supreme Court allowed brief stops based on a lower standard of reasonable suspicion. Maybe we should go back to probable cause, don't you think? A later decision clarified that an officer can't specify why he uh, suspects a crime is afoot. A traffic stop may only last long enough to check the driver's paperwork. Yet reasonable suspicion isn't scientific. Police identified a range of uh, suspicious behavior to justify turning traffic stops into investigations. And here's what they often uh, (laughs) cite. Uh, drivers uh, pulsating veins, limbatic movements, uh, uh, shifty eyes and windows that don't roll down suggest hidden drugs in the door panels. As a sign of potential criminal activity based on their training and experience, they flag as suspicious cars smelling too much like air fresheners, vehicles that are too clean or too messy, erratic driving, and driving uh, that appears too cautious. Ah, let's see here. A new Harley after a drug dog circled this motorcycle three times without finding anything. He was finally allowed to ride back to uh, Flugville. At first, I was glad to come home, but I also knew right away this doesn't seem right to me. No! I thought this don't happen to everybody. You know, you got all these ex-cops out there saying, well, this don't happen, that don't happen. You got some on YouTube, this schlucks. He figured his motorcycle club vest might have raised sus- uh, Cotto's suspicions. Uh, yeah, a motorcycle club vest. <laughs> a friggin' hog vest. Oh my god. Uh, Cotto, who was, since has left DPS to manage uh, security at his church, did not respond. Uh, there was a legal case and a reported $185,000 settlement after deputies pulled over a driver for littering. So you can, uh, mm-hmm. 11000 was uh, paid to cost for unjustified intrusion. So you do not have to sit back and take it. You don't. Take the fight to them. Now, let's go over some standings right now. At the end of 13 weeks, uh, Brian Bauman has 273 points to Jared Mees. Now, that's my rider right there. 264 points. Sammy Albert is uh, at uh, Halbert is 207. 
Bronson to Bowman at 162, and Brandon Robinson uh, is at 158. That rounds out your top five right now. Uh, the 14th week, we're going to be going into the Charlotte Half Mile, and then uh, the 15th is the AFT Finale at Daytona uh, Speedway, and the 16th is the Daytona 2. Lots of stuff going on in uh, Flat Track, man. We'll be keeping you up, but let's go to my final thoughts. Chinadel from Hollywood and Chinadel Evening Show. Join us Monday through Friday, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube for some fun times and very interesting entertainment. See you there, boys. Get your most unbiased and trusted biker news now at HarleyLiberty.com. Founded in 2012, Insane Throttle Biker News has been the place that all bikers come for what's happening in the scene. Go over now and bookmark HarleyLiberty.com. Rock Okay, welcome back to the show. Yeah, don't forget to subscribe over there at Hollywood and China Dow's channel. And I'd like to uh, say thanks for all the super chats that, uh, you know, probably on the show today and yesterday. That's great uh, because you two, my God, are they down throttle on us, man. Uh, I do put videos up over on BitChute. Make sure you go over to our BitChute channel. I'll actually uh, put in the uh, description box or the comment section that I uh, usually make and pin our BitChute uh, URL channel. That way you can go right on over there, man. We are not throttled down over there. Uh, it's actually a bigger uh, free speech platform. Uh, but my final thoughts. Mel, you have a chance to come on a big show. I say you take it. Let's have some discussions. Let's go over some points that you put out there. There's no restraints on you now. You're not a part of the uh, club, so you can't use that one on me. One thing I'm going to tell you, buddy, I am pissed off about. You go out there, especially for a lot of us, you know, there's a lot of misrepresentation from the media concerning clubs, all clubs, all the big five, all, all of them. And you come right out on a podcast and you say, yeah, we got our money from drugs and guns. Real nice, man. Real nice. I wonder how people are feeling about that one right now. How, how, how do you even do that? I don't get it. Are you trying to, like, bang yourself up or something, man? Uh, are you trying to put yourself on a pedestal? Come on, man. <laughs> that was stupid. You know, I'd like to hear your answer to that. Why you did it. Why you would say something like that on an air. Because when people hear that, that's what they're going to... Well, this guy used to be a president of this club, and he says this is what they used to do to make their money. Great. You know, we already had Sons of Anarchy. Now we have somebody coming out and says, yeah, that's what we used to do to make our money. And now people are going to go around and say, well, see, see, see. And anybody who was in the Chicago area in the 90s knows damn well that you're not going to be riding around in a Corvette with 187 on it and living the high life. That was one of the most dangerous periods in Chicago history in the biker scene, man. And you're just being flamboyant, doing this, doing that. Come on, man. You know, for those that uh, don't know about this specific time in history, because most of you guys were in diapers, probably, go online and look it up. Go online and see how bad it got. That's what I would suggest to you guys. And then come back and tell me this guy was riding around in a vet with 187 on his uh, thing with nothing going on during that period. Come on, man. Uh, like I said, I'll watch more of the interview. I just, you know, that thing was sent to me. I didn't have time to sit there for an hour and go through this stuff, so I found this uh, clip on this guy's channel. Go over there and uh, see if you can find uh, the full interview and see what kind of guy that this guy really is, man. But if you're out there trying to help people and stuff, this sure to hell ain't helping people. Guns and drugs. What's wrong with you, dude? Uh, as far as the profiling thing, man. <laughs> I love it when people finally realize 
what profiling is. I told you, you really don't know what it's about until it happens to you. That's why there's the Motorcycle Profiling Project. If you feel like you got profiled, go over there, fill out that little survey. Then get yourself a damn lawyer and go sue them. I think this guy, it said they got $11,000 out of it. It's real, man. It's real not only for club members, but it's real for the general independent biker. Hog, come on. Really? Ah. <laughs> uh. I'm telling you. But I do really enjoy uh, getting the stuff that uh, the Good Dad Bikers do. That was some good fundraisers there. And the uh, standings in the AFT. Awesome stuff, man. So can't wait to see the uh, season finale. See who takes home the gold, baby. And then, you know, I hope Mies is. You know, he's my favorite racer. But we'll see how it goes. Uh, but until then, you guys uh, stay safe. Uh, you got your questions, put them in the uh, comment section below. In all our platforms, make sure you share us. We appreciate it. Talk to you guys later.